across the country and that will bring in a slight change to our weather. We start feeding in some northerly winds and so it will turn brighter for a time but we'll also see temperatures just falling drop, falling off that bit more. Enjoy your day. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun, every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice, we are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening, I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. Lancashire Police are working to identify a body that was recovered from the River Wire. It was located in the area where mother of two, Nicola Bully, disappeared more than three weeks ago. They're currently treating the death as unexplained and say her family has been informed of the latest development. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has described the news as heartbreaking and distressing. Former Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville says the post-mortem examination might not give us information about what happened. There'll be a formal identification. The body's obviously, if it is Nicola, has been in the river a long, you know, nearly three weeks, or best more than three weeks. So what the what whether the post-mortem can ever tell us whether she entered uh, deliberately or or, or uh, by by accident. Perhaps we'll never know. There's been too much speculation in this case, of course. We've had all sorts of ghouls going down there and, and causing even more hurt for the family. So the sooner the police can get the uh, post-mortem and the identification done, I'm sure they'll be keen to, to get that information out there. A cabinet minister says Boris Johnson's intervention on the Northern Ireland Protocol is not unhelpful because there's still plenty of work to be done. Mr Johnson's warning that scrapping the bill would be a great mistake and that comes a day after Rishi Sunak and the European Commission president said they've made very good progress on fixing problems with the post-Brexit trading arrangements. The protocol bill introduced under Johnson gives the UK the right to ignore EU rules and leader of the House of Commons Penny Morden believes that gives the government a stronger bargaining position. I think, you know, it's, it's helpful to remind the EU that we have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. It's helpful to remind them uh, what those expectations are. And but I, I would also just say that, look, we, there are encouraging signs. There, mm. there is, uh, people are saying there's a lot more to do, but progress is being made. 
Sir Keir Starmer says under no circumstances will Labour do a deal with the SNP. Addressing a party conference in Edinburgh, he urged Scottish voters to put their faith in Labour in the wake of Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Sir Keir says he can bring the change Scotland needs and the tide is turning on the Tories and the SNP. And the musical programme for the King's Coronation has been revealed. An anthem written by composer Andrew Lloyd Webber is one of 12 new pieces to be played during the ceremony. Best known for musicals including The Phantom of the Opera and Jesus Christ Superstar, he said he's incredibly honoured to have been asked. Greek Orthodox music will also be on the playlist, a personal request by King Charles as a tribute to his late father. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now it's time for Free Speech Nation. A university professor goes into hiding after being falsely accused of Islamophobia. J.K. Rowling is attacked again. And the new Puritans come for Roald Dahl. This is Free Speech Nation. Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. So this is a show where we take a look at culture, current affairs and politics. And of course, we'll update you on the antics of our friendly neighbourhood social justice activists. We've had a busy week rewriting classic Roald Dahl books and trying to ban the phrase Christian name. Coming up on the show tonight, I'm going to be speaking to the university professor who had to effectively go into hiding after he was wrongly accused of Islamophobia. Aaron Brown from the British Comedy Guide will be here to tell us about the return of Baldrick from Blackadder and also the return of Faulty Towers. And we're going to discuss the future for the Scottish National Party following Nicola Sturgeon's announcement this week that she is, in fact, standing down. And I'm going to be speaking to Isabel Vaughan Spruce, who was cleared this week after being prosecuted for praying quietly outside an abortion clinic and also a young Catholic student in Canada who has been arrested for opposing his school's policy on gender ideology. All that and a whole lot more tonight on Free Speech Nation. But joining me all through the night are my comedian guests, Josh Howie and Leo Kurth. Hello, you both. I feel bad for you, Leo, because as soon as you came in, a member of the audience said that your shirt was horrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, a man with no taste. Yeah. Or maybe you're the one with no taste. No, no, this I, is the it, finest it, shirt it, you can get in Primark. <laughs> and, I mean, at least you couldn't have a picnic on it. <laughs> Josh, you always... No, look, I like that Josh dresses down for the show. I think that's a good yeah, thing. Yeah, this is like the show where I come to relax. Exactly. And have fun. Yeah. Whatever. What is that? Is that a leopard on... on... Uh, we're, not mess, sure, we're not sure what it identifies as, but I do know <laughs> that it was about £3 in Primark. OK, so. fine. Well, then, that is justifiable. Let's gonna start with some questions. We've got a fantastic studio audience tonight, so let's get some questions now. First one from John. Where is John? Hi, John. Hello, hi. Um, why have Roald Dahl's stories been rewritten? Yeah, so this has been all over the internet over the past couple of days. Roald Dahl, of course, the beloved children's author, uh, has had his books rewritten by the publisher Puffin. Uh, now, we've got some examples here, so let's have a look what we're talking about. So, this one first from the edition of The Witches. So, the first edition says, Don't be foolish, my grandmother said. You can't go round pulling the hair of every lady you meet, even if she is wearing gloves. Just you try it and see what happens. And that's now changed to, Don't be foolish, my grandmother said. Besides, there are plenty of other reasons why women might wear wigs. And there is certainly nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Wonderful. And this also from the witches. Even if she is working as a cashier in a supermarket or typing letters for a businessman. That has now changed to even if she is working as a top scientist or running a business. <laughs> nice little feminist edge to that one. And from the original Matilda, we've got... She went on... Uh, where is it? On olden day sailing ships with Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rudyard Kipling. And that's become, she went to 19th century estates with Jane Austen, she went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway, and California with John Steinbeck. <laughs> so this isn't just uh, censoring the bits that are perceived to be problematic, this is actually rewriting, uh, and it's not as good. No, it's just, no. Let's just first say that, I it's mean, not as good. You've got to admire the ego of, uh, of somebody who thinks that they can take Roald Dahl books and be like, no, I know how we can improve this. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute absolute nonsense. What, what are they going to do next? Are they going to take some felt tips to the Mona Lisa? Are they, <laughs> they going to put a... Uh, make a smile a bit more clear. Put a sunroof <laughs> in the Sistine Chapel? Yeah. You know, could we carve a, a vagina into Michelangelo's sta statue of David? It's, uh, you know, where's, <laughs> where's this going to end? OK, so the, my problem with all of this is is 
well, obviously, it's the revision of artistic works from history. You, you, we would have not, we wouldn't have a Western canon if we got rid of every author that had problematic aspects to their character. Mm. But now they're doing this because of what the things he's saying in the books. But the books are meant to be twisted, aren't they? They're meant to be dark. And yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of children's literature is to sort of give them a safe space to be able to examine these things, ugly, fat things. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to censor you in a minute, John. Yeah, well, th th I'm used to it. But, well, uh, the word ugly and fat have actually been taken well, out. Well, that's what I'm saying, ugly yeah. and fat. They've also taken out the word female, right. which is weird, and they put woman mm. in, like, somehow female is exclusive and now women because women means everything. Did they put woman with an X? In Woodluxon, uh, did they put that in? I don't know. No, okay. uh, I, be next. I, I don't read to my children. I just give them iPads. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I find this really appalling. I mean, it is this idea that, that it, you can revise an artist's work. I find it yeah. actually really morally objectionable. Yeah. I just don't think it can be uh, excused in any way at all. Yeah, I, th I think they crossed a, a red line with this. And yeah. uh, the, the sort of ideological thrust behind it is really obvious, because not only are they, are they sort of removing the gender uh, from sort of negative depictions of, of women, yeah. but they're introducing gender. So there's, there's, a, bit, there's a line where, it, where he says, uh, silly idiots or something. That's been changed to silly boys. So, so they're actually... That's actually worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah they've made it. They've it, re-gendered it. It's interesting that they took out any reference to Rudyard Kipling. And mm. that's just mm. because the, the sensitivity readers don't like Rudyard Kipling. Right. Also, Steinbeck, such a strange Isn't that replacement. Weird? What are they going to have, like, the end of like, breastfeeding babies? Because well, they're starving to death in Dust Bowl America. Well, also, isn't uh, that's the one book I read as a <laughs> student, by the way? Isn't *Of Mice and Men* quite a problematic text in of itself? Anyway, so aren't they making it worse? That wasn't the book I read. No, okay. okay *Grapes of Wrath*. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. There we go. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to move on now to a question from Jeff. Where's Jeff? Hi, Jeff. Hi. Should cricket's rulers stop trans women from pr playing against young girls? Yeah, I couldn't believe this story. There were, so basically, six first-class counties have asked the England and Wales Cricket Board why it is that a middle-aged player who transitioned to female is competing against girls as young as 12. My understanding of cricket and the way that cricket works, right, the local cricket games, you, you can have all age groups, right? So you end up yeah. with sort of grandparents playing against kids and, all, and it's all fine. It's all fine until a sort of a hulking middle-aged man comes in and there's a 12-year-old 12, 12 girl on the pitch. That kind yeah. of changes the dynamic a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, and this uh, trans uh, trans woman or, or uh, bloke who identifies as a woman, whatever you're supposed to say, uh, is already injured. Because, I mean, cricket's not a, it's not a no-contact sport. Uh, no. you've, you've got a bat in your hand and there's a, there's a sort of hard, leathery ball that you whack at people. And so he's yeah. already injured uh, an umpire <laughs> and another player who wasn't able to play for several months. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in cricket now. This sounds amazing. <laughs> You've got like some bloke and a frog just smashing cricket balls at children. This is yeah, it's, fantastic. It's turned into like the Hunger Games now, which is much yeah. more interesting. Because yeah. cricket is kind of dull, isn't it? So they do need to spice yeah. it up. And if it means injured children, so be it. If it's, it's going to get more people watching, yeah. better advertising. Yeah. Uh, but this is going to peak. This is if anything's going to peak Middle England. <laughs> yeah. This is the thing. It'll finally, that's going to be. It's going to be like you know in Australia they've got surfers, male surfers competing with women, and America's got skateboarders. Now we've got county well, critic, critic. Cricket. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be. Uh, it's going to be tough. But it's amazing. Yeah, like I say, people have been actually injured. And this is what's interesting is that this has uh, been going on for about three years now. Yeah. They put it towards the board, and the board has just been kind of going, "Oh, just go to Stonewall's website and check it out." But yes. you've got this a middle-aged man potentially sharing a changing room with teenage girls. Well, there's all sorts of potential safeguarding yeah. issues and all this. So there's a very serious aspect to all of this. But like you say, it will, it will that's the phrase, it will peak people, won't it? Like, people yeah. sort of wake up to the problem of this. And no-one's saying that this person can't identify however they like in their in their private life or in their public life, in fact. No-one's got a problem with that. They've got a problem with them smashing uh, cricket balls at children. Yeah, well, although, Leo. at least we know Leo. what Nicola Sturgeon is going to do next. She's going to be the booker for this cricket team. Yeah, <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds good. Well, she's got some time on her hands now, so I think that'd be Lovely. We get a question now from Tony. Where's Tony? Hi, Andrew. Hi, Tony. Uh, is Boris Johnson going to scupper Rishi Sunak's Northern Ireland trading deal? Yeah, this is an interesting locking of horns, isn't it? So Rishi Sunak, who's obviously been meeting with uh, Northern Irish politics, uh, politicians this week because he's trying to sort out this deal surrounding the protocol. He's sort of uh, liaising with the EU as well. This is going on and on and on. Of course, Stormont hasn't been up and running since last May. You know, they tried to elect a speaker again the other day. It didn't happen, and you need a speaker to implement legislation. We've had to push through the budget at Westminster. We need Stormont up and running. We need an executive executive in Northern Ireland mm. and the protocol seems to be the thing that's stopping it. So 
Boris is coming in. Might it change now? What do you think? No, I mean, Boris is coming in just to kind of mess with Sunak. It's like... He's having actually, fun with this, Yeah, right? because Sunak is actually, it looks like, doing something called being an adult and making <laughs> compromises. <laughs> and never to, catch on. Yeah, it's, what a crazy thing. I know it's gone out of fashion over the last 10 years or so, but this is like, there's actually going to be moving forward, having, yeah. having this compromise with the EU to have something that's working and sensible for everybody. And then, uh, and then Boris Johnson's coming along and just going, no, 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 don't don't get rid of that. And the whole point of that whole bill was to have leverage over the EU. Yes, and if yeah. they don't need it because they've made a sensible compromise, then what's the problem? But what was wrong with the uh, solution that had been posited before, with the idea of the red and green lanes when it comes to the the, uh, the trading barrier? What's wrong with that? You know, why, why, why can they make that work? Because you can just go through the red lane when you're supposed to go through the, the green lane. But what about honesty? <laughs> <laughs> why can't we appeal to people's honesty? Uh, because then uh, that's, that's what communism did. And look at that end of <laughs> So you don't think that, I mean, for instance, the, the DUP has some very clear red lines, and one of those is the, the idea that the European Court of Justice should have any kind of uh, say in the final, in the, dis, in the trade disputes in their country. And I think that's fair enough, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds fair enough, but I think the bigger picture is that the Britain and, the, and Europe are becoming closer together because of Ukraine, and just because it's been, it's been quite a long time since Brexit happened, so feelings are softening, and also there hasn't been the sort of stampede for the exit that, you know, some people in Europe feared Brexit would trigger. Do you think Boris might come back? Uh, yes. Yes. Really? I you think that's, he's, you think he's that's a, what this is about? He's a vote winner. He's, you know, he, he, he could win. He could potentially win You'd the next You'd love that, election. wouldn't you? You'd be all over that, Josh. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's possible, yeah. isn't it? There have been sort of intimations. No, it's not my... possible. There's no? no way. There's absolutely no way. I mean, maybe after the election. Well, I don't think at, even at this point there's anyone who can win no. it for the Tories. But what's really funny is that, the, that you've actually got people in the Tory party saying who are blackmailing Sunak going, and then when Sunak is, like, making these compromises, they're going, oh, well, now you're going to look weak. And it's like, you're the one who's making him look weak yeah. by forcing him to do this. Maybe it's not that funny. Well, I thought, you, uh, <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy a bit of Tory infighting, because you don't like them, do you? I don't mind them. I just want things to work. To work. <laughs> if yeah. possible. Yeah, I think that's what we all want, ultimately. We've got a question now from Justine. Where is Justine? Justin. Justin, sorry. It does say Justine on my autocue. I wasn't misgendering you. Misgendering you. Has the old old uh, been at you? <laughs> <laughs> is it time to stop using the phrase Christian name? <laughs> OK, yeah. This, oh. Please stop. Uh, so this is... <laughs> just, look, I cover this stuff every week. It's like sometimes I just think, please, give me a rest, just one week, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you don't do this, all right? But anyway, here we go. So a university's basically uh, tried to ban the phrase Christian name. They say it's an, an offensive... This is University of Kent, by the way. Says it's really offensive. Is it really offensive? Or is this just really patronising to minorities and non-Christians who actually don't care? Yeah, I don't think anybody really cares about it. They, they probably care more that you get their Christian name right, Andrew. Right and not call them Justine. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't like to blame yeah. what was written on the autocue. I'm not, I'm not just a puppet. I should have known that that was wrong. They also uh, want to ban uh, the, the word surname because they say it's patriarchal, because it's, it's, it comes from sir It's name. not spelt the same, is it? It's not spelt the same, but in medieval England it, pro it probably was. So they want to replace it with family name, but surely that's also problematic. It suggests, you know, uh, people should have families and, you know, the, the whole <laughs> nuclear, you know, uh, child-producing uh, aspect of, of being alive, which is, you know, yeah. uh, against queer theory. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Maybe the word, maybe the idea of a name could be problematic. Yeah. You know, mm. yeah, you know sort of labelling yourself. Just you know? the barcodes just or numbers. ID numbers, yeah. It should just be numbers and then there's no risk of misgendering. No, but the problem is that the barcodes are binary. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, didn't think that one through. Uh, anyway, we've got one more question now. This is from Mina. Where is Mina? Hi, Mina. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Um, are dissident TV channels still safe in the UK? Yeah, this is an interesting... So th there's a TV network called Iran International, which has now been totally pulled because they've been getting threats from Iran against its journalists. Uh, apparently there's been a significant escalation of these threats from, from the state in Iran. This is, so it's going to carry on operating as far as I'm aware from Washington, but this is kind of a bit freaky, isn't it? Mm. What do you make of this one, Leo? Well, yeah, and it's terrifying. It shows the extent that other states, uh, such as Iran and Russia, can come into our country 
and inflict terror and, and murder people. And we've had the, the scripple poisonings, we've had the oligarchs being, being killed by, by the Russian state. Uh, Iran obviously had the fatwa against Salman Rushdie, which you know ended up being you know partially successful with the, with the attack yeah. against him. So I mean, it's I don't know, it's, it's sort of terrifying. And you see, um, you know, the, the open borders that we've got. And I know it's it's not uh, there's it's not a, a, a perfect sort of overlap or anything, but I think I think it's it's related, and we're just not secure uh, in this country. Well, for me, I just wonder whether it's about you know standing up to sort of foreign states who attempt to intimidate. You know, I mean, when we when it comes to the Rushdie affair. We were having debates on TV, oh, was he asking for it? No, he wasn't, he wrote a book. Mm. So why didn't we just collectively stand up and say, no, our creatives get to write whatever they want, our TV channels get to show whatever they want. We don't listen because to... Because we're cowards. We're cowards, right. And, uh, but I was a bit, I, I'm a bit excited about this whole idea, to be honest, Mina, because when you mentioned dissident news channels, I was thinking, well, if we really just lay into Iran, maybe they'll start targeting GB News and then we can move to America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a silver lining to every terrifying scenario. Anyway. Iran! <laughs> Ooh, boo. I'm going to click that, put it online, and you can yeah. face the Please consequences. <laughs> I'm doing it. It's done. Anyway, after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be talking to a distinguished academic who was so worried about his safety after being wrongly labelled Islamophobic that he had to wear a disguise when he left the house. See you in a couple of minutes. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit up. Well, you oh, are. Well, you, that's my you, ringtone. You, no. My political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Speech 
Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. A university lecturer who was wrongly accused of Islamophobia has revealed that he was scared for his life. Such was the hate campaign he was subjected to. Professor Stephen Greer was practically forced into hiding after Bristol University Law School undergraduates claimed that elements of a course he was teaching were racist and discriminatory. He was exonerated, however, by an inquiry of any wrongdoing and has now written a book, Falsely Accused of Islamophobia, My Struggle Against Academic Cancellation. This was published this week by Academica Press. And Professor Stephen Greer joins me now. Professor Greer, thanks very much for joining me today. Could we start by just going through what the welcome. accusations were against you? What exactly were these students claiming that you had done? Well, it's important to bear in mind the background to this. I had been teaching this unit and the module, the unit's called Human Rights and Law, Politics and Society, and the, the module is entitled Islam, China and the Far East. I've been teaching this for nearly a decade and a half, including two Muslim students without incident. Basically, the University of Bristol Islamic Society, BRISOC, uh, claimed that practically everything in the model, in fact, everything in the model, a module, was Islamophobic. Um, even things like uh, the, 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 they, they told several lies, for example. They said that um, I had claimed that the Chinese repression of the Uyghurs um, was only superficially uh, discriminatory. And what, in fact, they'd done there was they'd elided to, that was exactly the opposite of what I've said, they'd elided a claim I made about the counterterrorism in this country, which I said was only superficially discriminatory, with a claim I'd said about the Chinese, which I said it was much more obviously, they were much more obviously a suspect community or a securitized community out there. So there were several other things, but, but they even claim, for example, that, that things that are universally acknowledged and accepted in the academic literature, for example, that in, in its early history, Islam spread through war, conquest, and later trade and conversion. Um, they claimed that was Islamophobic. Uh, and in fact, a lot of, a lot of things, everything that I said in, in the course was uh, based upon uh, the authoritative academic sources, and they claimed that it was all Islamophobic. I mean, this is very difficult to comprehend in many ways because um, it reminds me of the cross-party uh, in, in inquiry into Islamophobia that we had. And the government came up with this idea that if you were to mention that the Prophet Muhammad had uh, wives who we would consider to be underage, that that would be Islamophobic and anyone who suggested it was. But, of course, that's, that's in the Islamic text. So they're not really doing their research. But also, weren't you accused of laughing at the Quran and that kind of thing? Yes, I mean, that was another lie. What we didn't, the, the class la actually laughed at an extract from the Analects of Confucius, which I had uh, quoted in the same class as I'd, I'd quoted from the Quran. So the people who accused me of laughing at the Quran were either not paying particularly close attention or it was a, another deliberate lie. But there were so many deliberate lies in the accusation that it's difficult to give it any credit. And I think we ought to appreciate that the the motive for this uh, smear and this this, this vilification and victimization um, was to try and discredit my uh, defense of the Prevent Counter Terrorist Program and also to rescue another Bristol professor, David Miller, who was accused of anti-Semitism and who was eventually sacked from um, the the the, the the trouble that he found himself in. Can I ask you about the accusation? Because an accusation of Islamophobia can be very dangerous in of itself. I mean, if you look at the precedent of what happened to Samuel Paty, the teacher in Paris who was uh, attacked and killed. Similarly, of course, uh, the, the massacre at Charlie Hebdo. You know, this is not a, an accusation that should be made lightly. Uh, what has been your experience of this? Well, when I first discovered it, the, the, the complaint was made to the University of Bristol in October 2020, and they sat on it uh, for several months. I didn't even get, and I heard there was, there had been a complaint, but I wasn't told what it precisely was. I didn't find out what the complaint was until Brissot launched this scurrilous and very, very uh, hostile social media campaign on the 15th of November 2021. Um, and of course, like you say, even just being accused of Islamophobia and having laughed at the Quran, all of these things are 
uh, potentially life-threatening. So it was very, very frightening. And I appealed to the university immediately on, on the day itself that they must do something to stop it. And they haven't done anything to stop it, on, even up until this, uh, even up until today. Now, the campaign has retreated into the shadows, but a lot of the material, the um, uh, defamatory material, for example, the petition, is still readily available on um, the, the internet. So one of your previous guests was talking about cowardice, and I think that's exactly what happened in my case. The university could have and should have disciplined these students, but declined to do so because it was afraid of itself being condemned as Islamophobic. I mean, is there a broader problem here with this idea that one particular religion ought to be ring-fenced ring from criticism? Now, you've made clear that you weren't uh, being Islamophobic, but what about people who do want to mock Islam? Should that not be within our rights to do that as well? We mock uh, Christianity, Judaism, whatever. Well, um, I'm only going to comment upon the academic context. I think in the academic context, which is the one that most applies to me, um, everything I'd said was measured, careful, cautious, supported by the academic literature. And because it was that, I felt absolutely secure and safe and that there was nothing that could possibly be legitimately condemned about it, how wrong I was. And what sort of precautions did you find yourself taking once once the accusations came in? Well, the the, the immediate, immediate, in the immediate aftermath of it, nothing really. But uh, there was a, a suspicious incident outside my home on the twenty fifth of February, twenty twenty one, the day the, that Al Jazeera reported the story, and uh, my wife. This was during COVID, of course. My wife happened to be, had made an arrangement to travel to a young friend who just had a baby and whose husband was abroad um, the next day. And I decided I was going to go with her, even though that would have otherwise have been a breach of COVID uh, restrictions. We, we, we um, contacted the police. The police took the incident very, very seriously. And of course, they didn't regard the fact that I joined her for a few days as a uh, a violation of the COVID regulations. It was an emergency. What I did thereafter was when we returned to Bristol, I um, wore a disguise. At the time, I used to wear contact lenses, so I had a fair pair of fake glasses. I pulled the hood of my um, hoodie up. I started to grow a beard, but it took a few weeks for that to actually to get to any significant length. I carried a stout umbrella. I carried a little screwdriver in my pocket. So it was a worrying time, but over, over a couple of weeks, of course, the sense of anxiety diminished. And uh, I, also, I also thought of uh, leaving Bristol uh, and, and going to stay with my brother and his sister, my sister-in-law, who live in Northern Ireland. But I thought, this is, this is cowardly on my part. Um, if these people are coming after me and if they want to make me a martyr to freedom of expression, academic freedom, so be it. I've had a good life. I'm in my mid-60s now. I want to carry on having a good life. But if somebody wants to do me harm for this, for this reason, so be it. Do you feel now that you've been exonerated that, that things can go back to some level of normalcy? Well, no. Um, I, I've retired now. And the reason that I chose to write the book and to take the stand that I have is because that, that was on the agenda, that, that was, you know, planned. Um, had I been a younger man uh, earlier in my career, uh, I may well have taken a very different course of action. But um, in, in the last few months of my working life, the university uh, failed even to officially um, um, recognize or, or to, to validate my return to work. I was off work for, th for several months as, as you, as on a kind of the stress of this uh, uh, crisis from September 21 to January 22. The university failed officially to, to um, authorize my return to work. So I retired in September 2022 under a cloud and hugely demoralized and disappointed that uh, after 36 years of service, this was the reward that I had received. 
Um, and of course, potentially, I suppose, my life might still be at risk. I don't know who's out there who might. In Salman Rushdie's case, to whom you referred earlier, of course, um, it was over 30 years since the uh, fatwa and he was, uh, until he was attacked. So you never know when somebody's going to come after you and when they're going to launch an attack. Well, but, um, Professor Gray, we, we are out of time now, but um, thank you uh, very much for coming on the show and for writing your book, which is called Falsely Acclu Accused of Islamophobia, My Struggle Against Academic Cancellation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So, I mean, this is a very interesting case, and again, it comes down to university authorities failing to take into account that these accusations can be, can be scary. Yeah, and you also, know. I mean, look, I was a little bit offended that he was laughing at Confucius. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I'm over it. Uh, but no, and I think University of Bristol in particular seems to have a real issue uh, with mm. this stuff. And, uh, and like you said, it's, it's, a, very, it's a sad story, mm. really. He's worked there for three decades, more than three decades. And, you know, all it takes is a group of students to come in and make these false accusations. And kind of reminiscent of the Kathleen Stock uh, scenario, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, and, and the word Islamophobia is enough to herald their cowardice, like he said. Yeah. And that's an interesting, wasn't it? Because if you're te teaching about Islam, and we had the same uh, at a university in America where the, an art historian was presenting an image of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, which was a very yeah. important, recognised image in Persian art and a very oh, yeah. important I, image. I wouldn't do that. No, that is, uh, but, yeah. but there was there was legitimate <laughs> academic reasons for doing so, of course. Yeah, yeah, you know? and, and the the accusations of Islamophobia it shows that uh, you know if you uh, accusing somebody of Islamophobia or racism is an incredibly dangerous, toxic thing to do. So it should be illegal. If we're going to have hate speech laws, it should definitely well, come under. Well, you say that, but laws. sorry, but Bristol, that he mentioned David Miller. Now David Miller was accused of anti-Semitism and finally fired for it. The difference was the way that the University of Bristol dealt with that was to just it, utterly ignore it, it. It shouldn't be a, a faculty matter. It should be an actual criminal matter. This, this is... This is uh, yeah, but this if you're... His, his this course is fermenting, was... His, David this is Miller's fermenting, course was this is fermenting teaching hatred. hatred. Well, we've got fermenting we've hatred got, against we someone. Do have, well, we do have libel laws, however. Well, not laws, but we have the recourse to libel. If someone you makes should, an accusation... You shouldn't false. have to pay for a lawyer to, to clear your name from, from something like this. I mean, this, this is something that's, that's, that's heinous and it's invidious and, and deeply damaging to somebody, it should be a crime. Well, we're going to have to take a break now, but after the break on Free Speech Nation, iconic comedy character Baldrick from Blackadder will make, be making his first appearance for 20 years as part of this year's Comic Relief Appeal. And to discuss that and much more, I'm going to be joined by Aaron Brown from the British Comedy Guide. See you in a few minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate. 
with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. On Mark Dolan tonight, in my big opinion, is Rishi Sunak on the verge of a Brexit breakthrough? Boris Johnson got Brexit done. If Sunak can make Brexit work, it will be a turning point for his premiership. In my take at 10, Prince Andrew is likely to be turfed out of his £30 million royal lodge, with King Charles tightening the purse strings. Good news, it's time the pompous prince paid his own way. And my Mark Meets guest is Brexit supporting Tory legend Sir Bill Cash. We're live at nine. to Free Speech Nation. The BBC's Comic Relief Day will be back in March, raising money for poor and disadvantaged people around the world. And this year it will feature the return of a familiar face. <laughs> Who are you going to be then, sir? The noble Tommy? Precisely. Standing over the body of the ravaged nun. I want a wimple. Well, you should have gone before we started the picture. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, my father was a nun. <laughs> No, he wasn't. He was so, sir. I know, cos whenever he was up in court and the judge used to say occupation, he'd say none. <laughs> yeah, so that's Blackadder's inept sidekick, Baldrick, played by Tony Robinson. He'll be making his first appearance for 20 years, although Blackadder himself will not be making what would be an eagerly awaited return. So here to discuss this, I'm joined by Aaron Brown from the British Comedy Guide. <laughs> Say, I mean, we also had recently uh, John Cleese talking about um, the return of Faulty Towers in a new form, um, and now Baldrick is, is propping up again in comic relief. I mean, does this suggest that uh, there aren't many uh, characters or shows that uh, are, are more recent that we, we ha are, that are as beloved as those? I suppose. I, th I think it probably does. Um, I mean, for as long as comic relief has existed, it has brought up classics of the past. Yes. For example on, I think it was the second uh, Comic Relief Telethon in 1988, they included a whole half hour of full episode repeat of Dad's Army. Right. So it's never been above looking back to popular comedies and comedians of the past. I think the difference here is that this is almost the only thing we actually know about because there are so few popular comedies that they can make specials of. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, there's no, no harm, is there, in bringing back these old beloved characters? No. That's absolutely fine. And it's for a good cause. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I remember uh, recently there was a big thing on Twitter where people were talking about all the great things that the BBC had done for comedy. And this was because we were talking about getting rid of the licence fee. And people were listing loads of amazing comedies, but they were all 30 years old and more. Yeah. Um, it is... It, it's... It's difficult to get past that once you first notice it. Yeah. Um, there is... I, I, I tend to think there is very little today that you can't make an argument for um, deserving to exist, deserving to be made and broadcast on its own merit. But taken as a whole, um, it's quite an unsatisfying comedy meal. Yeah. There isn't much diversity in tone or style. Um, there, are, there are a lot of programmes that are ostensibly sitcoms, much more in the vein of comedy drama in reality, um, that feature people working 
in or around comedy, the media, 20-something, living in London, um, almost always unlucky in love. Yes. Um, and, you know, I say, these, these programmes, they're often very well written. Uh, some of them I really like, some of them don't do much for me. Um, and individually, I wouldn't say that any of them are awful, but it's, it's, the, it's that lack of diversity. Yeah, it's, and it's not to suggest there aren't, aren't talented people working in the industry, but, but rather that there's nothing really that stands out as something that mm. will stand the test of time as genius or something that is indeed laugh out loud funny. Yeah. I wonder to what degree, I mean, we've seen the cancellation of Mock the Week, but, you know, a lot of comedians have become, I suppose, preachers rather than comedians. Uh, a lot of comedy commissioners have become activists rather than comedy I mean, I see them tweet all the time about uh, white privilege and, and uh, gender ideology and that kind of thing. Yeah. It does narrow the scope of what kind of comedy you're going to get. Yeah, they're, they're, it's, it's, a, it's very much a monoculture mm. um, amongst the, 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 the creative gatekeepers, um, commissioners, producers. Um, so you get, you, you get very little that is reflective of anything outside the, the kind of stereotype of the, the metropolitan elite, yeah, well, let's university talk educated. I mean, last, um, last week we had uh, Samantha Presti, the comedian, and she'd published an article on Chortle, and people won't know that's an industry website where comedians often just write articles mm -hmm. and submit them, uh, and they put them up, and it's absolutely fine. But this was the only time I've ever seen the editor of Chortle step in and write a comment saying how much he disagreed with this, uh, because her view was not the fashionable view, yeah. and his view is very much in line with the identitarian, illiberal, modern movement that has captured the industry. Mm. So. Uh, is that just evidence of what's going on? And, by the way, her show was then cancelled uh, yeah. because she had unpopular views. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite ironic that you say you're, you're quitting comedy because you, you, don't, you don't feel that you fit in and that people aren't, um, people aren't saying anything that is pushing boundaries. Yes. And then you get cancelled for doing so. It's, yes. But, but they yes, proved your point, didn't they, rather? Exactly, they yeah. did. Um, I mean, you, you're quite right. It, it's, it's really... I mean, it's just so unhealthy. It's co comedy... Comedians are supposedly telling truth unto power. You know, comedy comes from the, the, the kind of heritage, the idea of the court jester, the person who was able to... Uh, prick the pomposity of the king and bring them down to the, the, if not the common man's level, then at least the lords and ladies' level. Yes. Um, but there doesn't seem oh, to God. be much of that anymore. It's, there's a lot of singing from the same hymn sheet. And that's an important point, isn't it, that you make, that, you know, we have now an industry that is run or dominated by uh, not just uh, uh, commissioners and promoters, but critics as well, who actually want the jester to toe the establishment line. Yeah. They don't want the king to be criticised. Yeah, more a ringmaster yeah. than a jester, keeping up, keeping up appearances. Um, I mean, you say that there are, you know, there have been certain changes around. You've seen the BBC was forced to move various operations out to Manchester, Channel 4, up to Leeds. And yet the, the people who are still staffing these institutions still in the, the decision-making roles, no matter whether they are from the north, from London, from the south, from Scotland, no matter their class background, no matter their, their sex, their sexuality, they're, they're always, they all seem to have exactly the same outlook, world view. And that is what's feeding in to, to such a, a staid and just uh, stifling uh, well, it's boring, comedy environment. It? It, is. It, it's boring and also, you know, part of their world view is, in fact, that those who disagree with them should not be platformed. So you will never get that diversity that you're looking Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Um, it's completely true. Uh, if, you, if you look at, like, ratings for um, not just comedy, but I think it is particularly acutely a problem in comedy, um, television ratings, so you might get um, five million people, for example, watched the live final of The Masked Singer on ITV last night. Um, contemporary comedy, I mean, maybe, at a push, a hit show will get 
1.5 million. Right. And they say that they, they excuse it by saying people just don't watch television anymore, it's all on catch up. Well, the likes of Call the Midwife or The Masked Singer or Happy Valley, any of these big ticket shows, prove that there are audiences there and that they do tune in and in huge numbers, just like they did 20 years ago, just like they did 30 years ago, if the programming is there that appeals to them. Yeah, but they'd rather watch some Z-lister doing karaoke in a mask. Depressing. Apparently so. <laughs> anyway, uh, Aaron Brown, thanks very much for joining me tonight. Really Thank you. Me. Nation. It's time to tackle the big political story of the week. After the announcement that Nicola Sturgeon is stepping down as First Minister, we're going to ask what the future holds for the Scottish National Party. See you in a minute. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi, Andrew Pierce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. With special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion, and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. In a shock move this week, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon announced her resignation. Unquestionably one of the major figures in British politics this century, Sturgeon has served as First Minister and lead of the Scottish National Party since 2014. Her departure appears to leave a vacuum with no obvious successor in place and other parties are sensing opportunities in Scotland. So here to assess the fallout from a tumultuous week in Scottish politics, I'm joined by the commentator and chair of the newly formed Scottish Union for Education. Stuart Waiton, thanks very much for joining me today. Uh, I want to ask you first and foremost, what are your views on uh, Nicola Sturgeon? Do you think uh, that she was right to resign when she did? Um, 
too, too little too late, perhaps. Uh, it's, it, it's a bit of a surprise. Uh, I think a lot of people are very happy in Scotland. Um, I think that, as you say, there is a bit of a vacuum. Scottish politics isn't, isn't filled with inspiring individuals or policies. Um, but I'd, I do think she she was quite an important person in terms of, I mean, I watch, I watch your show and all of the trends that you discuss, Nicola Sturgeon was at the pinnacle. She was very, very good at being a caring authoritarian so she, the, the laws, the number of laws that they've introduced in Scotland or attempted to introduce, um, which generally speaking went against the public's will. You know, it's almost, it's almost a, 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 you could see in almost every law, whether it's to, to ban light smacking or to introduce uh, the hate crime law um, or alcohol pricing and so on. In Parliament, you'd have about 70%, 75% voting in favour in the public, it was about 70%, 75% against. So that, um, what you saw in Scotland the, over the last... Sorry, go on. In that sense, the gender recognition bill, this is not a, a unique thing. You know, two-thirds of the Scottish electorate opposed it. The SNP wanted to do it anyway. But as you say, there have been things like the named person scheme, you know, banning two-for-one pizzas, these very sort of authoritarian nanny statish approaches. So is it just that the SNP are pretty much always out of touch and are solely relying on the issue of independence? Well, I think what happens is because they have the independence card, it's created a kind of elected dictatorship. So they'll play that card. People are, I think, understandably disillusioned with politics. In Scotland, you have an out, something that can inspire potentially the idea of a new start, which is having an independent Scotland. And so they play that card. And then once that's gone, they just spend their time introducing these new laws you know, a named person for every child, hate crime laws, um, banning of light smacking, alcohol pricing. Edinburgh City Council have now introduced a thing where um, it's going to be ve a vegan city. <laughs> so okay. children, pensioners, people in hospitals, anyone that's in a prison, if they're already there, uh, they'll have to have a vegan diet because uh, obviously, you know, we, we can't decide what's best for us or our children. Yeah, yeah, at what point, though, will the electorate just get sick of this and boot them out? I mean, the problem is you've even got someone like Hamza Yusuf is even in the running for the, the leadership. He's one of the most authoritarian people in the world, I think. He, you know, he sort of pushed through this draconian hate speech bill. Will the SNP ever learn? Well, just to, just to run with the Hamza Yusuf thing, I mean, bear in mind that he wanted the, uh, the hate crime bill to include the punishment for playwrights and actors even actors, right? So you're just reading a script. And if it doesn't fit within the uh, the framework of not being offensive to uh, whoever, then you could potentially have been arrested. I think it was up to seven years imprisonment. It was playwrights as well. I mean, that was got rid of, but not. it was against Humza's wish because uh, he thinks playwrights should clearly be being uh, not, not just cancelled, but arrested and imprisoned for their thoughts. Well, I think some of them are terrible, but I think that's a bit much. <laughs> you know, I mean, he also said that people should be arrested if they said hateful things in the privacy of their own home. I mean, do you think it'll be him? Or do you think this will be, you know, Kate Forbes or Angus Robertson or Swinney? Who do you think is going to be the next leader? Honestly, I haven't got a clue. I mean, most of these people, like most people in Scotland, they mean, they mean next to nothing to me. You know, they don't necessarily <laughs> represent anything. Um, I suspect and worry that the vast majority of them will have a, a similar mindset because in, in Hollywood, you just seem to have you know this, this term, this, this the blob, where essentially they talk to each other. And I've, I've been to the Scottish Parliament a number of times to, to challenge some of their things. And the, and the people that are sitting amongst you, the academics and the professionals, all the people that they like, just speak with the same script, talk about vulnerability, the need to protect people, need for greater safety, um, and so on. So, I don't okay, know, well, I, I, I can't, I can't If you could, just, we've only got 30 seconds or so, if you could just answer this question, how do we break the deadlock? How do we stop Scotland from being, continuing to be a one-party state? Well, a big thing that we're trying to do is trying to uh, explain what's going on in education at the minute, because in education, if you read the head teacher's documents, any of the documents, they're very upfront that education in Scotland is now about social justice. It's not about education. Education standards are collapsing. And parents, increasingly, when they find out about this, the promotion of the transgender approach, for example, 
the promotion of the idea of whiteness and white privilege. All of these things have now been established in schools. And I think parents, when they find out about this, are going to be up in arms because this is genuinely a form of social engineering and a dogma that has been forced down the, the throats of children in Scotland, not just the adults. So hopefully we can manage to do something. Absolutely. Shu Waiton, thanks very much for joining me today. <laughs> that's it for the first hour on Free Speech Nation, but lots more to come tonight. After the break, I'm going to be talking about the relentless and ridiculous campaign against JK Rowling. And plus, we're going to have some more questions from our live studio audience. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV, and he's back. Eamon Holmes, back on the TV Surprise with me this even morning. even remember my name. I know, it's been four months. You have holy water by your bed? Oh, yes. Oh, Already depressed. Yes. Oh, Eamon. Oh. Why, why do you not believe anything I say? <laughs> Eamon Holmes, back on GB News Breakfast at 6 a.m. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. And there's plenty more still to come on Free Speech Nation this week. I'm going to be speaking to a lady who was cleared this week after she was prosecuted for silently praying outside an abortion clinic. And we'll ask if the British playwriting industry is in crisis. But let's get a news update first from Tatiana Sanchez. Andrew, thank you and good evening. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. Lancashire police are working to identify a body that was recovered from the River Wire. It was located in the area where mother of two, Nicola Bully, disappeared more than three weeks ago. They're currently treating the death as unexplained and say her family has been informed of the latest development. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has described the news as heartbreaking and distressing. Former Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville says the post-mortem examination might not give us information about what happened. 
there'll be a formal identification. Uh, the body's obviously, if it is Nicola, has been in the river a, a long, you know, nearly three weeks, or best more than three weeks. So what the what whether the post mortem can ever tell us whether she entered uh, deliberately or or, or uh, by by accident. Perhaps we'll never know. There's been too much speculation in this case, of course. We've had all sorts of ghouls going down there and, and causing even more hurt for the family. So the sooner the police can get the uh, post-mortem and the identification done, I'm sure they'll be keen to, to get that information out there. A cabinet minister says Boris Johnson's intervention on the Northern Ireland Protocol is not unhelpful because there's still plenty of work to be done. Mr Johnson's warning that scrapping the bill would be a great mistake and that comes a day after Rishi Sunak and the European Commission president said they made very good progress on fixing problems with the post-Brexit trading arrangements. The protocol bill introduced under Boris gives the UK the right to ignore EU rules and the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Morton, believes that gives the government a stronger bargaining position. I think, you know, it's, it's helpful to remind the EU that we have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. It's helpful to remind them uh, what those expectations are. And, but I, I would also just say that, look, we, there are encouraging signs. There, mm. there is... Uh, People are saying there's a lot more to do, but progress is being made. Sir Keir Starmer says under no circumstances will Labour do a deal with the SNP. Addressing a party conference in Edinburgh, he urged Scottish voters to put their faith in Labour in the wake of Nicola Sturgeon's resignation. Sir Keir says he can bring the change Scotland needs and the tide is turning on the Tories and the SNP. And the musical programme for the King's Coronation has been revealed. An anthem written by composer Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's one of 12 new pieces to be played during the ceremony. Best known for musicals including The Phantom of the Opera and Jesus Christ Superstar, he said he's incredibly honoured to have been asked. Greek Orthodox music will also be on the playlist, a personal request by King Charles as a tribute to his late father. TV, online and DAB plus radio. This is GB News. Now it's back to Free Speech Nation. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Enough is enough. The hysteria over J.K. Rowling has been out of control for quite some time. But whereas such outbursts usually die down over time, this one appears to be interminable. So on Thursday, the New York Times published a piece by Pamela Paul called In Defense of J.K. Rowling. This was one of those rare attempts by the publication to dial down the hysteria, to point out what Rowling has actually said, as opposed to what armies of online activists have collectively imagined that she has said. But the response has been unhinged. Go. So whenever I'm in, engaged in discussions about J.K. Rowling's supposed transphobia on social media, I always ask for her detractors to quote a single transphobic thing that she's said. If she's really the monster they claim she is, that should be easy, right? But they never can provide a transphobic quotation because there aren't any. What they'll do instead is post a link to a video by an influencer who is committed to a bad faith interpretation of her words or who will claim the power to see guess her secret thoughts. Either that, or they'll change the definition of transphobia entirely so they can justify the smear. Take a look at this post by a writer for the Huffington Post. He says, let's make this really simple and clear. If you claim, as JK Rowling does, that trans women should not be in spaces designated for women, you are saying that trans women are not really women. That is transphobic. We shouldn't support people who are transphobic. So if you have nothing whatsoever against trans people and you support equal rights for all, but you also understand that women's safety depends upon the recognition of the reality of biological sex, you're suddenly a transphobe. This activist has decided that you hate people who you don't in fact hate. No more discussion, because he knows your private thoughts better than you do. The thing is, some of us are still interested in evidence and rationality and the value of not interpreting your opponent's views in the most uncharitable way. Some of us are adults, in other words. None of this would matter, of course, if it was just a few crazed anime avatars on social media, but it's not. Just a couple of days before the New York Times op-ed defending Rowling, there had been an open letter by members of the paper's staff accusing their colleagues of anti-trans bias. One of the signatories to this letter, a well-known writer and journalist called Gretchen Falcon martin posted a tweet expressing a desire to slit J.K. Rowling's throat. 
And of course, Rowling continues to receive endless death and rape threats on a daily basis from people who claim to be on the right side of history. Well, if they're right, the future looks pretty grim. And then the Human Rights Campaign, an LGBTQ plus civil rights body based in Washington, D.C., with over 800,000 followers on Twitter, posted a thread which made the following extraordinary claims. J.K. Rowling, apparently, has compared being trans to conversion therapy, has questioned hormone replacement therapy despite lacking any medical expertise, and incorporated transphobic plots into her mystery novels. But this is what she has actually said about conversion therapy. She said, many, myself included, believe we are watching a new kind of conversion therapy for young gay people who are being set on a lifelong path of medicalization that may result in the loss of their fertility and or full sexual function. Now, what does she mean by this? Well, as Hannah Barnes' new book has revealed, between 80 to 90% of adolescents who were referred to the Tavistock Pediatric Gender Clinic were same-sex attracted. There is a strong correlation between gender nonconformity in youth and being gay in adult life. Members of the staff at the Tavistock itself joked that soon there would be no gay people left, and whistleblowers revealed that homophobia was endemic. JK Rowling is not in any way comparing being trans to conversion therapy. She is saying that young gay people are at risk of being transitioned to better accord with society's heterosexual expectations. She isn't, in fact, talking about trans people at all. Here's what she actually thinks about trans people. I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I'd march with you if you were discriminated against on the basis of being trans. She's also said, of course trans rights are human rights, and of course trans lives matter. And I believe the majority of trans-identified people not only pose zero threat to others, but are vulnerable for all the reasons I've outlined. Trans people need and deserve protection. Wow, what a hateful transphobe. <laughs> and what about the HRC's claim that Rowling has questioned hormone replacement therapy d despite lacking medical expertise? Well, I presume they're talking about her concerns about puberty blockers. Now, the CAS review into the treatment of children with gender dysphoria emphasised that there is a lack of evidence to justify the use of these drugs, which are almost always a precursor to cross-sex hormones. Expert studies are finding more and more evidence of potential health risks of puberty blockers. So if it's Rowling's lack of medical expertise that disqualifies her from commenting on them, don't worry, because there are plenty of experts available who are reaching the same conclusions. And then there's the claim that Rowling has incorporated transphobic plots into her mystery novels. Well, this isn't true in the least. When her book Troubled Blood came out in 2020, written under the name of Robert Galbraith, a review in The Telegraph happened to say that the killer, at one point, disguises himself in a woman's coat. Cue the predictable outcry. The Pink News ran with, J.K. Rowling's latest book is about a murderous cis man who dresses as a woman to kill his victims. <laughs> Except it wasn't at all. Top tip for literary critics, always read the book before attempting to criticise it, because that will prevent you from looking like an idiot. <laughs> Next on the thread of lies by the Human Rights Campaign, we had this. In 2019, Rowling defended a researcher who was fired for being transphobic. The end result? A court agreed, and the researcher was not reinstated. Except that wasn't the end result at all. This is a reference to the case of Maya Fostata, a tax expert who sued her employer for discrimination. In June 2021, the decision of the tribunal in the Fostata case was overturned by the High Court, with the judge ruling that her views were protected in law by the Equality Act. Fostata wasn't being transphobic at all. She was expressing the legally protected belief that biological sex is real. So not only has the HRC got its tweet entirely backwards, it's also repeated a libelous claim against Forstarter. And you would think a human rights organisation might want to get this kind of thing right. Well, they've deleted that tweet now, so that's OK, isn't it? But let's move on to the HRC's next tweet. This one is just as libelous, and it hasn't been deleted. This says, rolling up her transphobia to new levels in 2020 by publishing a manifesto defending her transphobic beliefs and disparaging the community. Yeah, that didn't happen. What actually happened is that Rowling was being bombarded with rape and death threats for liking a tweet by a gender-critical feminist, and show, so she wrote a measured and compassionate statement on her website to outline her actual views. She reiterated her support for the rights of trans people and calmly explained that her experiences of domestic abuse had made it clear to her that feminists were right to raise concerns about the threat to single-sex spaces that may result from gender self-identification. 
not a transphobic manifesto at all, just sensible and liberal reflections on the importance of safeguarding. Recent revelations of male prisoners being housed in female prisons have, of course, vindicated that point of view. And then we have this from the HRC. Rowling apparently mocked the use of the phrase, people who menstruate, ignoring the fact that not everyone who menstruates identifies as a woman. Well, she wasn't ignoring that at all. She was making the point that there has been a concerted effort to erase the word woman in favour of misogynistic sounding phrases such as people who bleed and menstruators. But for the HRC, a woman is an identity category. For most of us, it's a biological reality. Again, no evidence of transphobia there. And finally, as the pièce de résistance of this thread of lies and distortions, we had this. In 2021, Rowling proceeded to criticise police for using a person's correct gender identity in their reporting. And they appended a screenshot of Rowling's tweet in which she pointed out that the victims of rape were being told that their attackers were women, that a rapist with a penis was a woman if he said he was, and that the victim and the police must respect the gender identity of the worst kind of criminals. Rowling was simply pointing out how Orwellian this is. And she was right. It's not about hating trans people. It's about prioritising victims of rape over the hurt feelings of their rapists. Carl Sagan was fond of saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The extraordinary claim that Rowling, a known philanthropist and campaigner for equal rights, is actually a frothing fascist bigot who hates people because of how they choose to identify, is so far off the mark that it doesn't really require much further discussion. The burden of proof is always on those who make the claim. And they have been asked endlessly to produce evidence of Rowling's transphobia, and they failed again and again. The conclusion, well, J.K. Rowling is not a transphobe, and anyone who claims otherwise simply doesn't know what they're talking about. It's about time these fantasists were treated with the contempt that they deserve. to the audience in a minute. Josh, I know you've spoken a lot about the J.K. Rowling thing, but I am get getting to the end of my tether here. Mm. We keep saying, what is your evidence for these claims? They never have any, and yet this seems to dominate the discourse. What's going on? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm grateful for that monologue there, because now, when I get into these debates, I'm just going to send them that clip. Right, OK. And, uh, so thank you for saving me <laughs> a lot. for you, Josh. Well, you've saved me a lot of time, <laughs> so uh, I'm very grateful for that. But it, it is so frustrating, and, and seeing the abuse, the rape threats, the death threats that she gets is part of what has certainly brought me into this course, because you're looking at this going, like, wow, OK, this, that's interesting. Like, why is she getting so much hate here? And then you look into it and you go, she hasn't said anything well, at the, all. This the, is mental. These rape and death threats would be unforgivable anyway. Even yeah, if yeah of course. No, no, of course. But you're... Them. No, absolutely. But just but, not, it's so the opposite of what but she the, is. But you, young people are so captured with this idea that she is this bigot and they, it's like the narrative for them has been so ingrained and so formed, they cannot step out of it for a second. They cannot, you show them evidence, like, please just read this thing. And yeah. they, it's like they're blind to it. Well, it's evidence totally doesn't matter anymore. And it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, a colleague of mine here actually made the point that uh, her son had recently bought Hogwarts Legacy, you know, the computer <laughs> yeah. game. And all his friends said, no, we're boycotting that. She's yeah. evil. You can't. It's like just a bit, why are, are kids just not being taught? to think and look at evidence and analyse what's going on? Well, kids are notoriously gullible. Uh, so, yeah, sure. you know, th this is why ideologues try and, try and grab the kids. You know, when, once you're as old as me and Josh, we're sort of too, uh, too jaded <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to believe anything. Um, yeah. And we know that, you know, the, the world is made up of, of grey areas rather than these sort of uh, pristine ideal ideologues. But there is no grey area when it comes to her. She is a person who is one... She actually priced herself, gave away her money from being a billionaire. She's only a millionaire so because she's given... So Savile. That's not a defence. <laughs> <friend. laughs> but the point is, though, you, you know, we, you, it's undeniable whatever you think of her view. She is a philanthropist. She's not a transphobe. Again, just a, a smidgen of evidence would help, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, nobody can isn't. ever, nobody can ever provide any any evidence. And there's lots of evidence of her saying nice stuff about trans people, which, uh, you know, to be honest, has lost her some points from me. OK, <laughs> well, there we go. Leo, always the contrarian. Let's get some more questions from the audience. We've got a question here from uh, Jenny. Where is Jenny? Oh, hi. She's from the block. Jenny from the block. <laughs> Why? Why is the Tavistock Gender Clinic still operating? Yeah, this is interesting. We've had the cast review sort of saying that basically the Tavistock is not safe for children, but they're still being referred for puberty blockers uh, at this gender clinic. Um, and what... Josh, 
again, it goes back to the evidence, right? We've yeah. had the report, we've had the interim report, anyway, it's yeah. made it absolutely clear. And this case, and, and, and they said it was going to be closed by spring, but it takes six months from when they officially announce it. So even if they announce it tomorrow, it's still right. going to be out there giving these puberty blockers that have, have this these terrible side effects for children to them until at least like after the summer. And we keep hearing these awful stories now of people who went there and they said like they had one or two appointments and all of a sudden they're on medication. And people say it never happens. Like I've got this person in my life, like sort of like a niece type person, she's like 21 years old. She's like, no, they hate, they have years of this therapy, the, oh, years yeah. of stuff. And I, sh I sent her the stuff this morning, I'm constantly saying, look, here it says here, this is reviewed in The Guardian. You love The Guardian, don't you? <laughs> look, this is what they're saying. Oh no, I can't, they won't look at the evidence. Yeah, it's very frustrating. It's got to go, isn't it? The Stop. No, are you joking? I mean, this, this is a wonderful thing. I'm, I'd be surprised if it wasn't funded by, by people on the right uh, because it's sterilising the children of liberal parents. And <laughs> so in a, in a couple of generations... <laughs> In a couple of generations, we'll have no more liberals. It's, it's going to be fantastic. OK, interesting spin on that. Let's get a question now from Matthew. Where's Matthew? Thanks, Hi, Andrew. Matthew. My question is, should the words male and female be phased out of the use yeah. of science? Yeah, so there was a collaboration of scientists in the UK and Canada. It had to be Canada. Uh, they've suggested that the words male and female should be phased out completely in science. They think that these ideas reinforce the idea that sex is binary. Hey, scientists, it is! <laughs> I mean, what the hell? Yeah, and some of the uh, phrases, the terms they're, they're bringing in to replace male and female. So, uh, male is sperm producing and female is egg producing. Well, here's an egg. I, I'm a woman. I produced an egg. Now do it out your butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it comes I from, right? Be, look, <laughs> look, again, like, we, come, we, we discuss these issues quite a lot, but when it comes to scientists saying this, that's when I really think we're lost, aren't we? Look, I don't want to... But, essentially, if you think that sex is binary and you call yourself... I think you should have your scientists... Uh, it isn't binary. You should have your scientists' licence revoked. It was not just the scientists, though. It's the medical journals are saying now sex uh, it's, is... It's crazy, but, they, but, but, no, it's not. but it's not just men and women and, and other words like that. They're saying non-native species, like, that's... What? Like, it's supposedly non native species is now anti-immigrant because you've got these spiders coming over here <laughs> hiding, <laughs> hiding in our bananas. Uh, it's, it's madness. Wow, that's pretty scary. I mean, you had as well in New Zealand, there was a, a case where the, the government wanted to introduce um, indigenous ways of knowing into the science curriculum. Right. So you would, you would learn about evolution and that kind of thing, but you would also learn about the, the goddess of the sky who's, who produces rain through her tears. <laughs> and, uh, and that would be taught on a par. Yeah. With the, and when someone complained, when an academic said, actually, this is a bit weird, yeah. uh, they all hounded him and he got fired. Yeah, and it's so patronising and reductive to think that, you know, they're sort of pointing at the indigenous people and saying, oh, this is what, this is what you think. You know, when actually indigenous people are probably, no, I've, I've got a subscription to, to The Economist yeah. and uh, <laughs> I browse the internet, I know the, the procedure that produces precipitation. Yeah, exactly. You had the Met Office the other day in New Zealand invoking... Oh, no, in Australia, invoking the gods of the sky. Mm. No, just tell us the weather, for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I've got a question now from Michael. Where is Michael? Yeah, good evening, Andrew. Um, is unconscious bias training really a load of non nonsense? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it is. Um, this is um, a leading figure in the civil rights movement, Colin Prescott, has rubbished the use of unconscious bias training uh, saying it's not the way to tackle uh, racial injustice. And it's interesting when you get these kind of figures who have this sort of pedigree amongst civil rights and they're the <laughs> ones coming out saying, actually, we need to calm down about this stuff. It's interesting as well, Josh, that unconscious bias training has been uh, roundly discredited uh, as having any utility whatsoever by all of the studies into it. It, does, it simply doesn't do anything. In fact, a couple of the studies showed that what they tend to do is make the, the, the workplace more racist. So why are we doing... That's certainly what's happened here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it nuts? I mean, again, we come back to evidence. Given that unconscious bias training doesn't really do anything... I mean, I had a teacher friend of me contact me recently saying, oh, I'm in an unconscious bias session, don't know what to do, it's all nonsense. And I said, you know, stand up and say this is nonsense, challenge it. But of course he wouldn't. Well, I did. I went. I did an unconscious bias training, and every time I asked a question that was, if I might say so, very insightful, uh, it was like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. And then, of course, that session they never did. happened. Right. They never, yeah. they never get to it. And they, because, because it's what we also have to remember is the people who are doing this unconscious bias training. It's all new for them. Yeah. So they don't have the answers to it. All they have to do is just go. Here's a bunch of articles. Here's a load of baloney. And you just kind of go, oh, oh sorry. And they get paid a lot. As and well. they get I mean, paid a lot of money. It comes down to faith, doesn't it? This is kind of like a religion, you know. At this point, they're, they're, they're peddling something that doesn't have any basis uh, in reality, and they're doing it. And they get paid a lot for it, aren't they?
It's, it's absolutely a religion, but I mean, it, it's something that actually costs companies a lot of money, not, not just in terms of paying for HR departments and uh, trainers to come in and then uh, paying to, to find people and, and deal with the, the processes that happen when people are accused of having some sort of bias or committing a microaggression, but the, the lost productivity and the fact that you can't hire who you want. You've got to hire somebody who, who you know, ticks certain identitarian uh, boxes. Uh, so I think, you know, a recession could really sort this out. And this is why I'm trying to crash the economy. Mm. <laughs> you are doing your best to do so. Well, let's hope Leo's right about that. Uh, we've got to go for a break now, but after the break on Free Speech Nation, I'm going to be joined by Isabel Vaughan Spruce, who was cleared this week after being prosecuted for silently praying outside an abortion clinic. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. <laughs> Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Free Speech Nation. Isabel Vaughan Spruce was acquitted last week after she was prosecuted for silently praying outside an abortion clinic. Vaughan Spruce, director of anti abortion group March for Life UK, was searched and arrested outside the BPAS Robert Clinic in Kings Norton, Birmingham, last December. Her arrest sparked protests, with her supporters saying she was being prosecuted for thought crime. Father Sean Goff was also arrested and criminally charged, and he was also cleared this week. Isabel joins me now, along with Jeremiah Ignabole from her legal representatives, ADF UK. Isabel, can I come to you first? How do you feel uh, now that you've been acquitted? Delighted. I'm really pleased that I've been acquitted and, and completely vindicated of any wrongdoing. But it's just a shame that it had to come to this. And what a few people have said, the process ends up becoming the punishment. 
that I had to go through, you know, quite a humiliating arrest on a public street and to be locked in a, you know, police cell and interrogated um, just to find out that, yes, I am allowed to think in my own head what I want to think. Um, so, yeah, it is a shame that it took that long and had to have that process to, to get to this conclusion. Did you have any sense uh, that this kind, these kind of repercussions might ensue once you were standing in that area that they considered to be out of bounds? Well, I was surprised, I was surprised that the police um, went to the length that they did. I mean, clearly we've got a very confusing PSPO in place. In fact, all of these PSPOs around abortion centres, the public space protection orders, have very confusing language and, and are incredibly far-reaching. Um, saying that, you know, not just protesting that's banned, but counselling and, and prayer is, is banned in certain forms. So, yes, that is very confusing for people. But I did not think that my, my private thoughts were going to be censored. Jeremiah, can I bring you in now? Um, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Because had the protest, had protesters been standing outside harassing people who were going to the clinic, uh, causing criminal damage, there would be laws in place to prevent that, and, and rightly so, presumably. But that's not what the, that wasn't the case here, was it? No, it, it wasn't. This is the first content-based crime that we have seen in the United Kingdom. It's the first time that laws have been created to criminalise um, the content, uh, the, 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 the subject matter, as opposed to the manner or the behaviour. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's been uh, prosecuted. And so what we are, we're in right now is the first time that fundamental rights are being targeted based solely on the issue at, at hand, the topic. So what we have is uh, 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 the, the A word, the abortion uh, subject being criminalized purely because it relates to abortion. The public space protection order refers to any uh, approval or disapproval um, related to abortion, including prayer and counselling. So theoretically speaking, if uh, Isabel, uh, somebody else was stood next to Isabel, just standing in one place uh, protesting about climate change, then that person wouldn't have been arrested as well. So this is a subject-based criminalisation based on ideas, and of course that's very dangerous. Now, I've had people on this show who, who come from either sides of this argument, uh, the sort of pro-life and pro-choice. Um, but actually, it's not really about uh, that debate, is it? This is much more about a freedom of speech issue and, in fact, a freedom of thought issue. I mean, uh, Isabel, do you feel very much that they were effectively trying to control what goes on inside your head and, and that they, that's what they were trying to enforce here? Yeah, it's, it seems very strange. I've I've really no idea why they were um, going to the lengths that they were. Um, so I didn't catch the beginning of your question. I think there was a little but, bit of a blip. But do, do you think, though, that this, is, this, this action was taken really to try to uh, stymie the debate in some way, to sort of put, uh, sort of, uh, put people off from, from protesting in any way? Yeah, I, I did find it interesting that I was charged with engaging in an act which was intimidating of service users. Now, bearing in mind I was there when the abortion centre was closed, I was only there when it was closed, it does beg the question, who's intimidating who? Um, and, and I have thought that all along, that um, I seem to be put under intimidation with the work that I'm doing. I certainly felt it was quite intimidating, the police and the whole process I had to go through. And yet I'm the one being accused of intimidating. And yet, you know, the work that I've done has helped hundreds of women. I, I clearly have no intention and never have intimidated women. That's the last thing that I would be doing. But um, perhaps, so perhaps I do find it quite offensive. Could you explain w w where exactly you were in relation to the clinic and, and, and what exactly you were doing? And that might help people to understand. Yeah, so I was quite near the abortion centre, um, probably a, a few metres from the abortion centre. As I say, it was closed. There was, there was um, nobody using the abortion centre at that time. Um, and I was silently praying in my head, um, just standing with my back to the hedge, not blocking the street, not talking to anyone at all in any way, not engaging in any conversations, not holding any posters, not offering any leaflets, just standing there silently praying in my head, not even manifesting that prayer in any way. Jeremiah, th this does beg the question, doesn't it? What on earth were they thinking uh, pursuing this prosecution? If, if, if what Isabel says is true, and I've no uh, reason to believe that it isn't, uh, she's standing there just 
praying silently, how could they possibly think to justify these actions? Well, you're quite right uh, to ask what were they thinking. It's the first thought prosecution that I'm certainly aware of um, in, in Western Europe, if not the world, uh, because this, if, like I said earlier, if somebody was next to Isabel um, and she didn't admit that she was praying in relation to the subject of abortion, then she simply wouldn't have been prosecuted. And the reason why this is a, a crucial issue is because uh, the right to freedom of thought is protected in both domestic and international law as an absolute right. Um, it's not like freedom of speech or uh, the right to privacy, which has to be balanced against other rights. Uh, freedom of thought is an absolute right that must be protected and cannot be penalized by any means. So uh, what we have is policing acting, uh, police officers acting on the basis of complaints uh, rather than considering whether or not the individual who's been complained about has any individual liberty um, that is rightfully being exercised. And so, of course, when acting on the complaint, um, even if the issue uh, relates to the absolute right of freedom of thought, uh, they go ahead to penalise the thoughts in question rather than considering whether or not the thought was lawful. Well, uh, thank you both for your time. I really appreciate it. Isabel Vaughan Spruce and Jeremiah Iganabola, thank you very much. After the break on Free Speech Nation, The Telegraph's theatre critic, Dominic Cavendish, will be here to tell us why he thinks British playwriting is in crisis. See you in a minute. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice we are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're gonna be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Welcome back 
to Free Speech Nation with me, Andrew Doyle. Is British playwriting facing a crisis? Telegraph theatre critic Dominic Cavendish wrote an article this week in which he outlined his reasons that he thinks that the threats to our dramatists are greater than ever. Dominic Cavendish says arts council cuts, anxieties about being cancelled and scripts stuck in development are placing a thriving part of British cultural life under threat. I'm delighted to say Dominic Cavendish joins me today. Welcome to the show. Fascinating article, by the way. Can we start with this idea about Arts Council funding and the extent to which new cre creatives are dependent on money, basically? Well, yeah, it's always been the case. There's always been whinging about funding cuts and there's always been an element of sort of back and forth about how much more money they need, how much better the economy and the ecology of theatre would be with more Arts Council funding. But I think the big sort of bombshell really happened in November when there was a sort of new tranche of funding announcements. And really major, major venues, mm. the most prominent one from, from my point of view being Hampstead Theatre, which is a kind of very prestigious, very long established new writing venue. It's been there for 60 plus years. It's produced some of the most eminent writers of our time. Michael Frayn's trod the boards, there was, uh, trod the boards there as it were, and we've had uh, work from um, Mike Lee, Abigail's Party. I mean, you could just kind of list, list, yes. them, list them all. But the fact is this, this theatre, with no real explanation, as far as I can work out, lost all its funding. So mm. it's now scrabbling together a sort of season, trying to put together something like its old self. But, I mean, it's essentially been a bit like, you know, detonating a power station. It's suddenly yeah. like we're switching all the lights off. You could luck with solar, solar energy. I mean, it's that, that's, that's the sort of message, I think. I mean, creatives have always complained about a lack of Arts Council funding. But is, is it the case that that's getting worse, but also that the idea during a cost-of-living crisis that, that uh, you know, artists should be funded, it just doesn't get prioritised. Well, I think there are, there's, a, there's a strange thrust going on here, in the sense that we've... A lot of us have, have campaigned and argued for more money to go out of London, so there's been this levelling up agenda that's arrived at the same time as the cost of living crisis, so there's a lot of feeling of, well, there's a lack of sympathy in a way for artists, why should they get public money? But the point of all that public money is to endow that sector with enough resource to take the risks that will create the plays and the experiences that will actually help dynamise the, the kind of creative economy. And you only have to look at Sam Mendes, who ran the Donmar very successfully, went on to, you know, direct the, the Bond films. That The Donmar has lost its money. Yes. And you think, well, you're looking at this agenda, which is levelling up, taking money out. But then you look outside London and you see that playhouses are also affected. So yes. the Watermill in Newbury, for example, the Oldham Coliseum is just shutting its doors now. So there isn't really... What there isn't really is a fundamental commitment to playwriting, the thing that we've all been sort of cherishing, I suppose, for the last you know, half a century at least since the post, since the war. And what's happening now is a sort of emphasis on participation, community, and the arts, I think, in some ways being co-opted in a sort of mission to cohere in yes. some vague way who we are as a nation. So there's lots of laudable sentiments about how everyone's creative and how we've got to come together as, you know, different communities and celebrate our creativity. But somehow missing in that, and literally the word playwriting is, is missing from the great document called Let's Create, which is a 10-year strategy from the Arts Council, suddenly playwrights really aren't even in the conversation anymore. And for someone like me, that's just absolutely baffling. And the, the, the fewer theatres and production companies that we have and are able to put on shows, it will narrow the scope of what gets put on. I mean, one of the things that struck me about your article is when you quoted David Hare, the playwright, talking about the piety that he finds in so many modern plays. Mm. There is a kind of sense of ideological capture within the theatre industry as it stands, in other words, a narrowing of the kind of views that are permissible on stage. And I have to be honest, a lot of the plays I've seen recently feel a bit more like sermons uh, than artistic works. Am I wrong? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Even the, the writers, some of the theatre community are saying, hang on, what's going on? And I think that's the most significant aspect of this debate, which is that, you know, up till now, last time I came on, I talked about, you know, trigger warnings, content warnings, and, and most people are in step with that in the industry. They sort of think, well, it's not very harmful to tell people the kind of content of the show. But on this, you're seeing, seeing people break ranks. Mm. They're actually starting to say, David Hare saying, you know, there's a party problem. Um, David Edgar talked to me, he's a very esteemed playwright who did the Nicholas Nickleby adaptation for the RSC, and said, you know, I need to, we need to remind people that plays involve conflict often, dramatic conflict. You need to be able to write opposing views and unpalatable views. And the idea that we'd have to have a primer on the basics of drama in, you know, 2023, I find quite alarming. So there is this sense, I think, of... I don't know whether it's captured, because that sounds like a, almost like a kind of conspiracy theory, because in a way there are all kinds of individuals nestling within the 
the theatre community, but it's like a sort of weird, tangled, woolly embrace yes. sort of good intentions that are becoming slowly more and more constricting. I completely agree. I don't think it is a conspiracy. I'm not talking about a long march through the institutions. I'm talking about a kind of um, orthodoxy that has taken hold, probably for the very reasons you described, a lot of good intentions, uh, just a lot of groupthink. It can naturally develop, I think. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can now almost time the moment where you'll get a little sermonising message in a play. I mean, yes. <laughs> at least four in the last, you know, as many months for me, and I've thought, here it comes. And, you know, I did talk to the now departing artistic director of the Royal Court about this. They're the, the epicentre of new writing. And I said, and I, these, these are the things that slightly give one pause. You know, I said, well, you know, I'm noticing there are, there are more kind of message plays now. And she said, yeah, well, we're all finding this, aren't we? We're all siloed. We're all basically not able to understand op opposite points of view. Yes. And that's obviously being reflected in the writing. And I don't want to start telling people to balance their plays because then we'd end up with anodyne debate plays. And that's, that struck me as slightly odd. Yes. And then I further said, well, you know, I know there's been some good work at the Royal Court. I said, but, I, you know, we're, there's some missing plays, I think, in the last 10 years. And I said, you know, if you wanted to write a play about critical race theory, for example, gender ideology, all those hot button topics, uh, would that be okay at the Royal Court? You know, would you program that if they were well written? And the assumption, of course, is that if a playwright does a really good job with a play, it'll get put on. And she said, well, even if it was well written, I would, I would think about it because I wouldn't want yes. to cause harm to any communities. So I think this whole language, as you say, the kind of well-intentioned language of preventing harm, is starting to encroach upon decisions about what appears on stage. But well, I think a lot of young playwrights know that they're not going to get on unless they tow a certain line and that the message is clear, that it sends the right message. Uh, and I've, I, I've even spoken to people in theatre companies who talk about there seems to be a consensus now uh, that they ask the question, is this your story to tell? Do you have the lived experience necessary to tell this story? That's completely anathema to the creative spirit, I think. What do you think of that? Well, the, 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 the logical endpoint of that thinking, and it is beginning to creep in, I think it's m more on social media channels, really, as an idea of, of sort of outrage, like who is this mm. ex-playwright to write about Y experience, is that we'll end up with playwrights simply delivering their one-off lived experience play, and then they'll be forgotten. And, and um, David Edgar talked about the Primark playwright as, you know, this kind of fast fashion of writers who turn up, they, they give their sort of... Their, their, their viewpoint, and then we're on to the next. And that's yes. no way to run a career or a, or a theatre industry. I think, that's, I think that there is a sort of serious problem here of, of free... Well, this is what this programme's called. Theatre should be a free speech forum. It's becoming a safe space, I think, and there's a lot of anxiety about what, you know, what people might infer or how people might get offended by certain pieces of work. I mean, I'm amazed at, I mean, having this conversation. 20 years ago, when I was starting out as a critic, we'd just seen one of the most extraordinary bursts of energy in new writing. There's the so-called in-your-face generation. Oh, yes. And they were shocking people left, right and centre. There were unmentionable things happening on stage. It seemed absolutely baked in that what theatre was about in this country and why it was so lauded abroad was that it took constant risks, it wasn't afraid. And we've now rode back completely from that to a point where we're now having... Uh, I spoke to a playwright who's, who's got a play opening in Bath this week, which is absolutely on the, on the moment, which is about cancel culture and universities, and hooray for him. But, you know, he said, this could be my last play. I'm thinking, this better be good, because it could be my last play. Why are we even having that conversation that writers feel, you know, they could be out on a limb and too far out and off, you know? Well, uh, there's a lot to think about in that, and hopefully we can have you back at some point to talk a little more about it. Dominic Cavendish, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you. So after the break on Free Speech Nation, we're going to be speaking to a high school student in Canada who was banned from attending classes after leading a protest against the school's policy of allowing transgender students to use the washroom of their choosing. See you in a moment. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. 
Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. We'll spend the GB News team on the ground. I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there. From 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Canadian high school student Josh Alexander was arrested by officers on the 6th of February after he entered the school in an attempt to participate in one of his four classes this term. In November, he had organised a protest with the apparent intent of stopping transgender people from using the washroom of their choice. Josh Alexander was originally suspended and then issued with a non-disciplinary exclusion notice by the school board. And joining me now to discuss this is Josh himself. Josh, welcome to the show. Can I ask you first, uh, what happened that got you in trouble with the school? Hey, thank you for having me on. Yeah, so uh, like you had said, I uh, had organized a protest at my school um, regarding the male students who had been using the female washrooms. Um, now, this protest didn't come until I had uh, already communicated with the principals and teachers and uh, another female student expressed the same concern and we were completely um, ignored. Uh, so I organized this protest, and uh, two days before the protest, they suspended me indefinitely, and uh, and then they um, they they threatened all the other students and told them they would wouldn't uh, they would, they'd face consequences if they uh, joined the protest with me. Anyways, I went ahead with the protest. It happened. It went fairly smoothly, um, and then they were uh, scheduled to uh, welcome me back after over 20 days of school days. And uh, so, yeah, I had a meeting and they informed me that I was to be permanently banned from two of my classes and I was only allowed to speak to certain students. Um, this was obviously a uh, blatant disregard for my uh, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and uh, I decided to protest that. And then Bye, you tried to come back to go to your class and you were actually arrested. Was that something that came about because the, the school authorities themselves uh, uh, called the police? Yeah, yeah. So I was in class. I returned, and uh, yeah, they called in two police officers and arrested me. This strikes me as quite incredible. I mean, Josh, do, do you have some sense about, or perhaps you can explain, what was your objection? What, why were you protesting the idea of uh, people who identify as women but are not biologically female using those washrooms? What's what's your thinking behind that? Well, yeah, just as a uh, as a young man, when a few female students come and address me with concern, it's my duty and it's my obligation to take a stand. And uh, if this is a stand that aligned with my Christian values, so I, I took it to its fullest extent and it ended up getting me put in the back of a golf cart. 
And what is the general feeling among the student population about the protests that you were organizing? Uh, I'd say it's pretty mixed, but uh, I, I have a lot of haters and I have some supporters, but uh, the majority of supporters are afraid to speak out on my behalf because, uh, well, they've, they've watched the uh, education system make an example of me so far. Well, I have to say, Josh, from our perspective over here in the UK, Canada seems a bit out of control when it comes to these issues, insofar as it, it's, it seems as though the authorities don't even want to have the discussion or to have a debate about these issues. They just want to impose by force one particular worldview. And I would suggest that being arrested is a good example of that. Would you agree? Yeah, so like there, there is obviously a mainstream narrative and it's not just happening here in Canada. It's happening all over the world. And I'm sure you're experiencing it there as well. So they're, they're trying to silence uh, anybody who speaks against it and especially anybody from the younger generation because that's who, mainly who's under attack. And when they see somebody with some influence, uh, such as myself and that generation, they're going to uh, do their best to silence them. And what is their argument for having you first excluded and then arrested? Is it that they think that you're potentially causing harm or that you're some kind of threat? Did they give you any indication of what their thinking behind this was? Yeah, they actually, I could quote the line they said. They said that um, they felt my presence in the building would be detrimental to the physical and mental well-being of the pupils. So uh, that's, that's their reasoning. So they've said that explicitly. And when they had you suspended, did they give you any reason then? Were they very clear on that? Uh, they, they actually refused to release allegations until um, almost 20 days after the suspension started. And uh, those allegations... Um, stated that I had uh, stated that male breastfeeding is pedophilia, which I did say, and that I also said that there's only two genders in the classroom uh, that had a transgender student, so they considered that bullying. So you but, accept uh, that yeah. you have said things that people find offensive, but your view is that yes. the arrest might be a step too far? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm not going to silence myself just because somebody finds it offensive. Do I hope we can work that out with the individual? Absolutely. But uh, I'm not going to uh, restrict my freedom of expression. And are you able to go back to school now? Is there a, a resolution that you can see? At this point, no. I'm out for the remainder of the year. OK, well, Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. Really interesting to hear your story. Time for social sensations. This is the part of the show that we devote to the wild world of social media. First up, comedy show South Park, well known for its celebrity takedowns. And this week, they picked on a couple of people who you may find familiar. Let's have a look. <laughs> we are here because privacy is a basic human right. How many more princes and his wives have to live in this nightmare? <laughs> hey, can you two can keep it down? I you ever heard of a thing called privacy? Yeah, nobody gives a shit. Will you two just shut up and go away? OK. <laughs> so they've turned, they've turned Harry and Meghan into Canadian yeah. royalty, right? That's what I thought that was a documentary. <laughs> 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 I mean, they, they have been mocked a lot for constantly going on about the need for privacy and, yeah. uh, on Oprah's <laughs> show. Um, you know, obviously there is and that... In their books that they write and then sell for money. Yeah, there is a kind of hypocrisy there. I mean, surely they're, they're just right for satire, aren't they? Yeah, and uh, South Park just nails it again. Yeah. Well, they always do, don't they? They always yeah. do this really well. Um, we're going to just have another look at this one. This is a... Uh, we've got one more clip, I believe. Oh, no, we're not. Sorry. They're telling me we can't do that. So we're going to end the show instead. Listen. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us for Free Speech Nation. Uh, this was the week when the phrase Christian name became taboo. Roald Dahl's brilliant best-selling books were rewritten. Uh, and 12-year-old uh, girls found themselves facing middle-aged trans women at cricket. Uh, thanks to my panel, Josh Howie and Leo Kurz, and to all of my guests this evening. Uh, stay tuned for the brilliant Mark Dolan tonight. That is next. And by the way, uh, I'm going to be back on at 11 o'clock for Headliners. That is the nightly paper preview show where comedians take you through the next day's newspapers. I'm going to be on. Josh is going to be on. Leo isn't. So do join us. <laughs> It'll be a great show. Thanks for watching Free Speech Nation. Hello there, very good evening. Welcome to your latest weather updates from the Met Office. I'm Jonathan Vautry. We ended the weekend on a fairly mild note and we will continue on that theme into the start of the week at least. It's due to our winds coming up from a southwesterly direction, a mild one from the Atlantic, but those winds are going to be particularly brisk across northern areas of the UK due to the squeeze in the isobars underneath this low pressure system.
system. So we could see severe gales for a time across Scotland overnight, even across the Pennines, just to the east of the Pennines, it will be a particularly blustery night. This comes accompanied by a band of rain moving into Scotland. Generally further to the south and east, it will stay dry but cloudy and underneath that blanket of cloud, temperatures are going to be holding up for all of us. So certainly a frost-free start to the new working week. That band of rain though does stall a bit over areas of Scotland, so it could prove to be a fairly damp and wet day here. Some patches of drizzle possible elsewhere, particularly across western locations. Areas further east might see a slight break in the clouds and the odd brighter or sunnier spell, but most of us will generally see grey skies. Temperatures though still well above average for the time of year. Highs of 14, maybe 15 degrees in some spots. We will retain the cloud for many of us throughout Monday night. That first band of rain does eventually shift its way northwards into the highlands, but we get this second pulse coming on later on in the night, so retaining that wet theme as we start off Tuesday here. That will also become accompanied by, again, some stronger winds, but generally further south, the winds will stay lighter throughout Tuesday. That will help the feel of things a bit, but it is going to be another grey one. If we were going to sum the day up in one word, cloudy. This band of rain will then start shifting its way in towards the end of Tuesday and into Wednesday. And behind that, we herald in a slight change to our weather. This northerly feed of air will just drop our temperatures down slightly. It's not going to be exceptionally cold, but they will be moving more towards average for the time of year. Bye bye for now. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. He's the king of breakfast TV and he's back. Eamon Holmes back on the TV Rise. with me this 